Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Charles. How are you feeling today? Oh, I am sick. I have a cold. It's the uh, first one I've had in, uh, geez, two plus years. Okay. And I am such a baby when I'm sick. I, I hate it and uh, I'm very needy and living alone does not does not uh, make that easy. The cat is not willing to wait on me at all. You know, I, I hear they have training for that. I hope I might need to trade him in for a model that's uh, a little bit more empathetic. He does not. He does not care about my. Uh, yeah, my, my illness or my needs whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, you'd need to trade him in for a dog. I think for, if, you want, <laughs> if you want, if you want empathy, I don't know if cats are. You know, or one of those service or, or monkeys. In the service that, monkeys. They make yeah, service that, monkeys. They make service monkeys. Yeah. Again, I, uh, we had a neighbor wow. whose job it was was to train service monkeys to work with uh, people with like spinal injuries who couldn't do stuff, and they wow, they would like live with. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, full size gorillas or chimps or anything. They were they were smaller monkeys, but they would be able to run around the house and get stuff for them and help them do stuff. That's so, awesome. I need so what I'm YouTube, saying is I, I need to YouTube some of those. That sounds what I'm saying is like, that's, that's what I need for the, you know, six days or whatever that I have a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Rentamonkey.com. A uh, million dollar idea. Mm -hmm. All right. How are you doing? Um, I'm well, I'm, I'm, I'm very good. Thanks. Yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I know we, we, we did some, uh, some dancing over the weekend and at, uh, at a local who's we, well, okay. Do attended, <laughs> which I give you lots of credit for, um, uh, you know, kind of to watch that. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was happy to be able to practice a little Foxtrot and learn a couple of basics, uh, you know, salsa and, and rumba and things like that from, uh, from our instructor and yeah. yeah that was that was a lot of fun yeah that was the uh, last time i got out of the house for any length of time and i uh, figured uh you know i already planned on going already had uh, committed to to paying for our coach to uh to dance with me for a couple of dances so i figured ah, i might as well show up and i just kind of sat there on the sidelines with my mask on for i don't know about half an hour then i got up and left yeah yeah but uh it, it looked i, I could see uh -huh. How if I wasn't sick it, and and I knew more than two dances, it could potentially be fun. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Even if even if that's, that's that's what's great about going with an instructor is she's going to teach the basics and stuff like that. And so, you know, um, just learning the you know the, just the basic step of you know a few of those dances and even even some of the the more seasoned veterans that that were there you know they you know they come up and and they taught me you know the basics and they were it was great you know um so i i i definitely enjoyed it um and and fortunately was able to take care of some you know stuff around the house tomorrow or yesterday and and so i i, I feel pretty prepared for for the week and uh i'm excited i've got my my christmas spirit green uh forest green uh, nice. v-neck on for uh to celebrate christmas this week yeah I, it is I, uh, I go all out i go all out clearly clearly yeah I, I can't believe this uh this year is is finally almost over yep 10, yeah. 10 11 days left and we'll be done on to 2022 that's nuts 2020 the sequel I uh, better not be. <laughs> better not be. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's jump in. I will uh, do my best to perform up to my usual uh, standard, which uh, floats around uh, a five, five and a half out of ten. I was going to say five, uh, five and a half out of six. <laughs> you usually, well, do a great job carrying. Thank you, carrying the show. So we'll we'll see we'll see how it goes. All right. So uh, this week. We are reviewing uh, and analyzing chapter four of No More Mr. Nice Guy, uh, entitled "Make Your Needs a Priority." Uh, so let's let's jump in. Um, okay, so one of the features that uh, Dr. Glover talks about of a nice guy is uh, they pride themselves on being low maintenance, and uh, low versus high maintenance is kind of a concept that. Uh, we tend to associate with, I mean, at least I have in my past with describing uh, women in our lives, whether we consider a girl to be a high maintenance or a low maintenance type of woman or, or when Charles is sick. Yeah. Or, or when I'm sick. Yeah, right, that's right. true. I'm definitely high, <laughs> very high maintenance. Um, and I, I think as part of that, we, we almost make a, uh, 
we conflate the low maintenance, high maintenance with femininity, masculinity, where, you know, the more feminine a person is, the more high maintenance they are and the more masculine they are than the more low maintenance they are, Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, doesn't when you think about it, doesn't really make a lot of sense. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the concept of being needy and neediness when we uh, when we work through the material. But uh, it, it is it is certainly uh, Glover's assertion. And I, I think uh, we would agree with this based on what we've seen in our own lives, as well as the lives of our nice guy, friends and acquaintances that um, guys will try to appear needless and wantless and think that that makes them low maintenance, which then thinks that that makes them masculine and better than someone who is open about their needs and wants. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think there's definitely some pressure on, on men and little boys to do that. Um, you know, as I was going through the chapter again this morning, I realized one of the biggest drivers for me in terms of trying to be low maintenance and, and, and becoming a nice guy through being low maintenance was um, a, a medical issue that I had to deal with as a child. So when I was seven, I was diagnosed as a type one diabetic and that requires checking your blood sugar. And back in the day, there was, you know, insulin pumps were brand new and there was no right. continuous glucose monitor. So it was, you know, getting a, you know, getting a, a needle out to, or a little Landsat out to check your blood sugar. If I had a low blood sugar, I'd have to go in the middle of a class to the nurse. Right. And Oof. then, and then someone once in a while would have to take insulin via injection. And that's not something you do out in the open, even, even as an adult, it's a little bit, it's a little, it makes people a little bit queasy. So as a child, you know, I was really, needing to be treated differently. And that's the last thing you want. Right. So, so now I needed to, I figured out ways to not seem needy. I had these needs that were different from everybody else. And now I had to develop strategies so that I could hide that so that I didn't inconvenience anybody. Um, cause I didn't, I didn't want to be made fun of or, or stand out. So I developed all these coping mechanisms that Glover talks about in the book because of a medical issue that I had. Right. And so right. I, I realized, wow, Hey, uh, this is, this is how, one of the ways that I became, you know, really fixated on not presenting as needy. And, and that kind of translates into everything so that I then yeah. would develop these habits where I would um, seek out people who um, maybe, you know, uh, were, 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 were needy in and of, of themselves so that I could focus on their needs and be able to hide my own. Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and connecting with those people. Um, so yeah basically it's it's that's that's something that i found in myself and um and and by doing that that translates into into other parts of my relationships with with just about everybody in general is i don't want people to have to take care of me i don't want my needs to be put out there but the problem is just like everybody else on the planet i've got needs too and so then how do i you know how do i get those needs met without having them exposed to the world yeah, and I, I was thinking about this this morning before we started, which is, um, like you said, everybody has needs for sure. And so what is it that makes someone needy in the negative connotation that we think of when we say, oh, that guy or that girl is needy, uh, specifically when it comes to nice guys? So uh, think think about two different men. Uh, man number one, uh, he he knows what his needs are. And he's willing to say to, say, a romantic partner early on in their relationship or before they decide to start a relationship, he says, hey, look, I, I've learned these things about myself. Um, and these are the things that I need emotionally, sexually, you know, mentally, whatever. And these are the things that it takes for me to be happy and healthy in a relationship. Are, are you willing to you know, work with me to meet these needs? So that's guy number one. Guy number two is, uh, OK, I have these needs. I've never really looked at myself that much to know exactly what they are or where they come from or why they are what they are. And I'm certainly not comfortable telling you what they are. So here's what we'll do. Um, I'm going to have these needs that I won't really acknowledge myself. And I'm certainly not going to tell you about. Um, 
when you happen to meet those needs through a combination of your own empathy, which I'm going to rely on and luck, then everything will be great. But when you fail to meet these needs that you haven't ever actually been informed of, then our relationship is going to be pretty miserable and I'm going to be hard to live with. Which of those two guys would you call the needy guy? I'm voting for number two. Yeah, that's not even a question. That's not even a question. And and honestly, it's just you describing guy number one, as you described it, that is so uncommon for me to have experienced and seen in my own life and, and the people that I, even the people that I know that I was almost going to be like, well, guy number one doesn't ever exist, you know? And, and it's cause I think it's such a, such an issue these days that it's yeah. so much more common for people to be type number two. No, I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I can, uh, I think I've met a couple guys like that in my life. Um, but it's, it's not, uh, it, it's certainly pretty rare. And, uh, those are the kind of people that you like to spend time around because, you know, you know where they stand and you know where you stand with them. Um, yeah. So, uh, it, it definitely competes with the idea of, you know, the fewer needs or wants I express, not that I, the, I mean, the nice guy will think the fewer needs or, or wants that I have, but in reality, it's the fewer needs or wants that I ha- that I express, the more virtuous I am, the more of a man I am, because right. I don't uh, I don't express those needs to people, and so I'm super easygoing, and nobody has to worry about me. It's like, yeah, you know, nobody has to worry about you until they fail to meet those needs that you're not willing to verbalize, and then all they can do is worry about you and what you're going to do next, what you're going to say next, what inappropriate weird thing you're going to come up with out of frustration for you know, feeling right. like you got ripped off in this uh, covert contract that you never told me about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, and, and it's, it's like, you know, buying something on my Amazon and then you get it and you look at the description and, and everything is, you know, it looks great. Five-star reviews. And then you get it and it's nothing like what you read about how, frustrating and upset are you right and this is this is just something you purchased online right i mean it's happened probably to all of us where we've got oh it looks the reviews look great or whatever it comes to find out you know maybe it was you know paid reviews from the manufacturer or whatever what that is and you get it it's a piece of crap and how frustrating is that in and of itself now could you imagine a partner yeah that that does those things that you're you're, i am I'm sure. And that um, you've invested say, time, effort, and love into perhaps. Yes. Uh, I, I've certainly been that partner and I, I, I Me too. I've seen the frustrate, I've seen the frustration that, uh, that it can bring. Um, cause the thing is, I mean, everybody is going to work to have their needs met, whether they acknowledge them or not. So either you're going to do it in an honest, direct way, or you're going to be indirect and unclear and manipulative and controlling, but you're going to, you're going to find a strategy for getting what you need out of the world. And I think the important thing to think about too, is that there's no way for you to meet all of your needs by yourself. And I know that's something that kind of goes through my mind and a lot of, a lot of people's minds and especially I mean, I would say, you know, people who are tend to be very smart in one area in life and, you know, can do things on their own and are tend to be independent and maybe some have some entrepreneurial tendencies where they kind of think they do everything on their own and by themselves and and the best themselves and have a really tough time accepting help from other people or even bringing people in to be part of a team. Those are all, I think, similar type of states of mind where I can do everything on my own. I don't need anybody else to fulfill what I want to do. And then that's where you get into trouble. And that's it's it's unfortunate because we have a lot of resources at our disposal as individuals. And sometimes we forget that, you know, to really fulfill what what all of us need is is we do need to connect with other people and we do need help from other people in some capacity at at, at some point in life. Yeah, I agree. And I think, uh, I mean, I think one of the messages of this book is going to be, you know, look, you, you are going to, you're going to need things from other people in life. And the way you choose to interact with those people is going to determine how successful your relationships are with those people, um, both for you and for them. And obviously, the, uh, 
the contracts that we make with people, the more open those contracts are, then the more uh, each side who's involved in the contract gets to say, you know, yes, this will work for me or no, this won't. And so ideally, you know, our friendships, our uh, romantic relationships, our work relationships with people will all be based on deals that we make and contracts that we form with those people where we openly and directly say, hey, I'll do this for you if you'll do this for me. And we all get to, you know, evaluate and, and decide if that's a good deal for us that we want out of life. And then we can say yes or no to those offers, right? Yeah. And I think it's important to be able to have the courage to say those things. And when you do say them, that they are the truth and that you aren't, you aren't right. minimizing them or changing them to please the other person. And the key, I think, to doing that is feeling secure enough in the relationship that you have with that other person and confidence enough in yourself to know that if you say something and they don't like it, that it is okay and that you will survive and life goes on. Right. Well, part of the problem, though, is that lack of confidence is what makes it hard for nice guys to to actually make decisions that will result in their needs getting met. They will they will make decisions that make it almost impossible for those needs to be met. I mean, they will choose yeah. to connect with needy or unavailable people who can't meet their needs. They'll operate from an unspoken agenda of, you know, hey, this is, you know, I want and need this one thing, but I'll pretend like it's this other thing that I need instead. Um, they'll, you know, sort of pussyfoot around the real issue and the real requirements that they have. Uh, and then when people do get too close, they'll, they'll push them away or they'll sabotage the relationship because actually, you know, getting fulfilled will make them uncomfortable because deep down they've got this toxic shame and this belief that they're, they're unworthy of having those needs met. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even, even to this day, you know, I'm very cautious about if I'm checking my blood sugar in public or taking an injection or anything else like that, you know, I'm, I'm better as an adult, but I still have those those flashes of being a child and, 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 you know, standing out or making people uncomfortable or, you know, and, and th that go through my brain and that I, that I fight and that I have to consciously say, Hey, look, this is, you know, this is not, this is not the end of the world. I'm not going to go hungry. I'm not going to be exonerated from the group. I'm not going to, you know, people aren't going to be angry at me for, for doing these things. And it's, it's insane that, that, that has to happen, but it, it does. The nice thing is that it, you know, the more you practice being, being a little bit le less caring about what other people are thinking and being a little bit more selfish, the easier it gets, but that's an uncomfortable process in and of itself, you know, being selfish. She talks about that in, in, uh, in this chapter as well as how to be selfish and, um, and, and just that it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the uh, in the future, if it makes you feel better, what we'll do is when we go out, I will uh, I'll bring a little vial of saline solution and uh, a lighter and a spoon. And if you have to give yourself an insulin shot, I'll just uh, tie off and make it look like I'm injecting heroin. And so no one will pay attention to your insulin situation. They'll just be looking at me. You're a true friend. You're a true friend. <laughs> Only a true friend exactly. would, fake, would fake a heroin addiction for me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really appreciate that. I'm going to ask that from, from all my friends from now on. You really should. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And I would, that, I would that's a fantastic it. idea. And then I could, I could explain to the maitre d', oh, no, what I'm, no, this is just saline solution. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, just supporting my friend. To, I'm just supporting my friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's There's talk. something wrong with you. Um, yes, just to, you know, I mean, oh, you, no, you, you could you could have just said taken an injection, you know, like a diabetic. But no, <laughs> you you there's the line, and there's Charles jumping over the line right into a heroin addiction. Okay, that's great. I yeah. I would have to do something that would definitely distract from you, uh, very uh, discreetly injecting your insulin, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, so, that would work. That I would think work. it would. Yes. Uh, okay. So. Um, Let's let's talk a little bit more about the uh, the idea of the covert contract, which is uh, one of the things that Dr. Glover mentions uh, a lot in this book. And I think we probably referenced it in uh, in earlier episodes, but we'll we'll say it again. So, the root of a covert contract is I'll do this thing for you, whatever this happens to be, and you'll do this other thing for me, and we'll both act as if we have no idea that we have this arrangement with each other, and it. Sometimes it's so convincing. Most of the time it's so convincing. The other person has no idea. So 
some of the examples that he uses kind of frequently is, you know, I'll, I'll clean the kitchen for you, but, uh, you know, that means we're going to have sex later tonight. And the <laughs> wife, the wife has no idea that she signed on to this agreement. And so the guy cleans the kitchen and then he's waiting for sex later that night. And, you know, she would rather read her book or just go to sleep or whatever. And then he gets highly offended that she broke the deal that she didn't even know she was in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hysterical because it seems so ridiculous. Um, but here's another one that I know I've fallen into and I've been on the other side of is saying I love you to somebody because you yeah. want them to say I love you to you. Right. And that to me is a very subtle and it, and it, it didn't you know, occur to me until he kind of explained it that said, hey, you, you know, you're allowed to ask someone to tell you that they love you. Uh, believe it or not, you, you can do that. I mean, I don't know if anybody ever would, because that would come across kind of as needy, right? But it's worse that you say, I love you, and then expect them to say, I love you back without without saying anything, you know? And now right. if they don't, you, you start to build a little resentment. And if you don't say anything about it, you know, uh, th then that can, that can lead to worse things. Things kind of spiral out of control with, with, with that. Just that very subtle little, little statement right there is a covert contract that most people don't realize that we're, we're, we're using all the time. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it, it speaks to a mindset of, you know, this thinking that if I'm good enough as, and good, good as I define it, if I'm good enough, then I should be loved. I should get my needs met without me having to ask and I should have a smooth problem, problem free life that that's the nice guy paradigm. And that's the covert contract that the nice guy has with the world and the world just isn't on board. The world, right. uh, the world is, is not, is not in on that contract, even though the nice guy expects that it is. Yeah. Um, so one of the, one of the symptoms of this, uh, this way of thinking is, uh, caretaking and, uh, Dr. Glover draws a distinction between caring for someone and caretaking where caretaking is, is focused. Uh, it's basically where you focus on somebody else's problems or their needs or their feelings so that you'll feel valuable. You know, I'll, uh, I'll meet this person's needs for them. I'll meet their wants for them. And in doing so, that means that I must have value. And then I'm also deserving of having my needs met. Right. But also hiding your needs, right? You're focusing, right. you're spending so much time focusing on their needs you know, there's, there's no, there's no time for you to talk about your needs or focus on your needs. But oftentimes I've heard of people who are, you know, doing a lot of things for other people and, and doing the caretaking eventually get to a point of where they're, they're complaining about how burnt out they are and how sure. none, none of their needs are being met. And you, all they're doing is giving and providing and doing and stuff. And, and well, that's your fault. That's as a nice yeah. guy, that's your fault, not theirs. Yeah, and that uh, uh, leads to what Dr. Glover calls the victim triangle of the guy who, the nice guy who gives, hoping to get, and then what happens? Well, what always happens is he doesn't get as much back as he expected or as much back as he believes would be fair. So he gets resentful and frustrated, and then he lives with that resentment and that frustration until such a point as it builds up. <laughs> yeah, he can't live with it anymore, and he explodes with rage and whining and complaining and pouting and criticizing, etc., and just becomes a miserable person to be around. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and anything, I think it's, it's extra shocking when somebody does that because they have been giving and being generous and, and being like this perfect person, you know, to, to the world. And then for them yeah. to go 180 degrees and, and be whining and complaining and, you know, and, and like losing control it, you, you've you've set the bar so high, and then you turn into you know uh, this 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 you know selfish child basically. Yeah. And and usually it's you know it's a very quick turn. It's not like it builds up over. You know, it's it's not like you know they're complaining. It just you know it'll just explode at one point. So it 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 can be very shocking. It can be shocking, and you know, in a heterosexual male female relationship it will also nosedive a woman's emotional attraction for you as well yeah and, i mean and that and that could absolutely have a cumulative effect on a relationship 
I mean, I know you said heterosexual, but even in a gay relationship, if one partner acted that way, I think it would nosedive attraction regardless true. of, right? That's between true. two people, even as friends, right? Even if yeah. you, know, you and I or whatever, and all of a sudden like, you're really complaining about having a cold all the time, you know, then I would totally nose. <laughs> No, 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 no. Seriously, you, 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 you know what? Uh, we, you know, we're just uh, messing around. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it'd be different if you actually were generous and giving to me all the time, and then exactly, and then, yeah. right, and if and I, then, I, and if, right, right. And if I was telling you how great I was all the time, right, right. Yes. Well, I do do that half at least. Um, yeah. So it, yeah, it's, it's really uh you know, do, do you want to build up your needs behind a dam and then have the dam break? Or do you want to have just a nice, you know, reasonable, steady flow with your partner of here are my needs. Here's what I need to, here's what I want. Here's, here's what I'm looking for. And, uh, just have that steady, that steady flow instead of the, I have no needs. I have no wants for, you know, weeks, months, years on end. And then the dam breaks and they're just, you know, going to be, going to be drowned and, and flooded with the uh the repercussions yeah no fun no definitely not so one of the things that glover gets into and uh you know he talks about getting a little bit of pushback from is talking about selfishness and uh this idea that the, the nice guy needs to um understand what it means to become become selfish and I don't think he what what he's what he's not talking about is he's he's not trying to build a society full of selfish men that only care about their wants and their needs, um, but rather because a nice guy has learned to sacrifice themselves in order to survive, their recovery has to center on learning to put themselves first and make their needs a priority. Um, you know, and that's that's not a that's not a model for the rest of your life of where you put your needs and wants in front of the world's forever at the expense of other people being able to meet their needs. But it is a a model of okay, I need to I need to figure out a way to take care of my own wants and needs and satisfy those so that you know I'm not just a a bottomless pit that's always looking for other people to meet my needs for me because I'm I'm not willing to acknowledge or talk about them. Right. Yep. Yep. And so again, the nice guy, uh, he looks at having acknowledging needs. That means he's needy, but like we talked about before, you know, what is needy? The guy that acknowledges his needs and, and is willing to talk about them and, and ask for people to, uh, in an open and direct way, work with him to meet them or the guy who wants to pretend that he doesn't have any needs. And then, you know, the needs just kind of trickle out or, or flood out in, in bursts of rage. Yeah, I mean the simple thing is one's being honest and right. and vulnerable potentially by exposing that and one is being dishonest and pretending that they you know are something that they're not and that's when I think everybody most people will be a little bit upset that you're 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 selling something that you're not delivering right Right. No, hundred percent. And so, you know, when, when, when a man learns to put his needs first, uh, he gets a lot of benefits out of that, uh, which is, you know, the, the likelihood that he's actually going to have his wants and needs met goes way up. Um, you know, as the opposite of caretaking, he learns how to give judiciously, which means when he does give to the people in his life, he learns to give to those people what they actually need, not what he needs to give them. Mm, um, mm. he's able to give without resentment or an expectation of what the other person is going to give back to them. And ultimately it makes him less needy and more attractive, which I, I would say, you know, most men, if, if given the option, if you said, Hey, would you like to be and appear less needy to the people in your life and be more attractive to them? Is that something you'd be interested in? And I think most guys would probably say yes. And here's something to think about if from the get go, you are able to express what your needs are and you, you are more likely to get them filled a lot more quickly than somebody who's kind of hiding their needs and waiting for them to be met, which, and most of the time, most of them are not going to be met if any of right. them. So now the person who is, who's presented their needs and at least gets some of them met, 
the stress level is down because you're not hiding anything. So you're going to be able to operate at a higher level anyway. You're going to be able to then identify and, and connect with people on, on, a, on a higher level and actually be able to really you know, help them should you, should you want to or, or, or need to because you're not you know, your stress is down, you're not hiding anything, you're not being dishonest, but also you are getting some of those needs met. And so, you know, just like kind of putting on your oxygen mask first, right. it's the same concept as you're getting some of your needs met first. And now you can turn around and give to other people and you can now provide for other people, provide that support. Whereas somebody who is just constantly giving and giving and giving and isn't putting any fuel back into the system, they're going to run out of fuel and, 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 they're not going to be able to give at, at such an, a higher level because none of their needs are being met and they've got this underlying stress from hiding everything. So it's benefit. It's a benefit for everybody. You know, if, if a guy can learn to be selfish a little bit as you know, at the beginning and, and, and be okay with, with expressing what, what his needs are and making sure some of those are being met. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, committing to changing yourself in this way is, uh, is not easy. And Dr. Glover talks about the, you know, making the decision and getting comfortable with this idea is, is harder. Making the decision is harder than actually implementing it. Um, implementing it is easy because, you know, once you've decided that, okay, I'm going to, uh, in, in his uh, case studies, he has three guys that he talks about who, you know, he encourages them all, you know, take a week, at least a week and put your needs first all week and, and then see how it works out for you. And, uh, you know, they pushed back, but eventually they, they did it and they, they got some good results as a, uh, as a result of it. But, um, it is not easy to make that decision of, I'm going to consciously get what I need out of life for the next seven days. And I'm going to make that the priority instead of pleasing the people around me, because I think, you know, when I please the people around me, it makes life easier. Yeah, and I, I like the the uh, the mindset that he provides in the book. A few statements about how to make that decision and how to support your decision to to start being a little bit more selfish. Uh, he talks about having needs is is part of being human, um, right? Mature people making uh, meeting their own needs a priority. They can ask for help in meeting their needs in clear and direct ways. Other people really do want to help you meet your needs. And this, this world is a place of abundance. And I know as I'm doing things for myself, I do need to remind myself and, and using those phrases or variations of those phrases help me feel a little bit better, relieve some of that anxiety about being a little bit selfish and uh, for myself. Yeah, it's uh I mean, even, yeah, just the language of it is, is enough to make us feel a little awkward and a little like, uh, I'm not sure if this doesn't feel right. This is uncomfortable. But again, it's like you, uh, you know, when, when you look at the people who have given the most, uh, as far as charity and things like that to help, to help the world around them, uh, it's very rare that a, an extremely impoverished person is on that list of the biggest givers, right? Mm-hmm. It's mm -hmm. the, it's the richest people in the world that are able to give the most to help out their fellow men and women. It's not the, it's not the poorest people. Yeah. So, I mean, when you think about, you know, you could argue about whether they, you know, the rich do enough or things like that, but certainly, you know, if you look at the list of people who have given away, you know, these huge fortunes to help the, help the world, it's, it's not the, it's not the poorest people that do it. So it's, you know, these are people who have focused on themselves. They focused on building their, their business. They focused on building their, their own wealth. And then once they've done that, they've had the opportunity to give away tons of it to make big differences in, you know, uh, whether it's vaccines or clean water or whatever, they've been able to help a lot of people. And I think that's kind of the message. It's focus, focus on yourself and building yourself up to what you want to be. And then once you've done that, you'll have the ability to help other people. Yeah. And I think it can be done when you're building yourself up. You can do it in ways where you're not hurting other people. I think, you know, having yeah. that abundance mindset means that you're not taking away from others to build yourself and to, and, and, and to get your needs met. Now right. there's certainly, you certainly can do it that way and, and blowing other people's candles out to make yours burn brighter. Sure. But that's not sustainable. 
And that's not, that's not something that you're going to feel good about. And uh, so I think, you know, doing it in the right way, you know, getting right. your needs met in the right way where you're not, you're not damaging or hurting other people is, is important as well. Okay. So I think uh, I, I would encourage anybody listening. If, uh, if, if you're following along with the book and you're following along with these episodes that we're doing and you feel like uh, you'd like to take a step to see, see how this goes, then by all means commit to, to spend the next seven days uh, putting your, your needs and wants first, make it a priority. You know, you won't have to manage what it is that you want out of life with the people around you. Just ask the question of, okay, is, is this, is this what I want? Is this what I need? And if it is do it, and if it's not, don't do it and see, see how it goes. See, see what kind of uh, results you get. And I think most people will be pleasantly surprised that uh, uh, when you put yourself first, uh, it's a better experience for yourself and for the people around you because you're doing it in an honest way that, uh, again, you're not, you're not looking to step on other people or make their lives worse. You're just going to, going to make yourself the priority and, uh, you're going to be the guy that takes care of yourself so that you can then take care of others. Yeah. You're, you're bringing your best self to the world and to other people by doing this. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to do it. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to go the next seven days and see, uh, see how many opportunities I have where I, where I watch myself to see, okay, am I, am I uh, responding to this work situation or this personal situation in a way that makes me feel like I will, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the good guy who's always there in a pinch, or am I doing what I, what I truly, you know, want and need for the best life that I can live. And uh, when we come back next week, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to hearing that. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thanks, Dan. We'll, uh, We'll do this again next week and we'll, we'll hit the next chapter. Sounds great. Thank you, Charles. Have a good All one. Right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.